This tutorial is going to cover working with blueprints and the fundamentals of logic modding in general. I'll be doing this mainly by working through a couple of example mods, which should hopefully cover all of the bases. I'm going to be making these mods for Mirror's Edge Catalyst, though the concepts involved should be about the same for any game Frosty supports. I want to preface this by saying, first of all, I assume you've watched my previous tutorials already, and secondly, it helps to have a background in programming already. By that I mean there are some concepts such as data types, which I'm not going to bother explaining in this video. I also want to warn you that logic modding is hard and time consuming work, especially in larger and more complex blueprints. Hopefully though this tutorial can help to lessen the learning curve a little bit and help you avoid some of the common pitfalls. For the first example, I'm going to work with this PFL slow motion asset. For reference, logic files often follow a common naming convention where PF stands for prefab and L stands for logic. Instead of L you often see S which stands for spatial. These are just different types of blueprints. I've picked this asset because it's very basic and easy to follow. You can see from the references tab that this reference is used in the PF runners root asset and runners root is the internal name for the official dashes in the game. If you're familiar with the game, you can probably figure out that this slow-mo asset is then used for the slow-mo effect when you cross the finish line. So when you open up a blueprint, you get this editor called the property grid. And as you can see, the blueprint has a variety of properties in it. And let's start by looking at the objects. Objects essentially provide functionality and have their own internal logic that executes, which can be customized and triggered by properties and events that they expose. Then objects can interact with other objects to build more complex logic. In a way, they are preset building blocks that allow you to construct functionality quicker rather than manually writing code. For example, this slow motion entity can put the game into a slow-mo state. The timescale property defines just how slow the slow-mo is, and these transition time properties presumably make the timescale transition smoothly rather than instantly. A lot of mods just tweak values like these, or disable entire objects or blueprints. There's a ton of objects or components or entities or whatever you want to call them, so I'm definitely not going to be listing them all off in this video. If you click the three dots on an object and click create new, you get this window which lets you basically pick from any of the available objects and you can search for you know, whatever math entities or something and find what you want. Generally speaking, you'll learn what useful objects are available and what they do just from experience and by looking at existing blueprints, for example. So this blueprint obviously doesn't have many objects. The interesting ones here are this slow-mo entity data and this audio mixer entity data. These are probably the ones which are actually creating the slow-mo effect in the game. Uh, these other ones, this float bool and compare bool entity, uh, are probably part of the logic which controls these slow-mo effects. Next, let's look at property connections. These are used to pass values between objects and are fairly simple to understand. Essentially, you define a source object and a target object, and you define a field on the source object to take the value from, and a field on the target object to pass the value to. For example, this first connection takes the value from this float entity and passes it into the timescale property of this slow motion entity data. This then controls how slow the slow-mo is. Uh, ignore these flags properties for now, um, I'll come back to those later. And by the way, these field property names are readable for me because I have a strings.txt file set up. If you don't know what that is and these just look like a bunch of gibberish to you, watch my frosty editor tips video. Uh, it makes reading these blueprints infinitely easier. Okay, so I'm gonna look at event connections next. And these are also pretty straightforward. Like property connections, you have source and target objects, but rather than field names, you have event names. The first one has an unresolved hash here, so I'm not exactly sure what that does. So let's look at uh, the third one, why not? So basically what's happening here is we have this compare pool entity data, uh, and when the condition is true, we decrement this flow entity data. We also have this target type, which says event connection target type, networked, client, and server. And this is to do with realms, which like flags, I will come back to a bit later. So now let's check out this interfaces property. Basically, this blueprint can be referenced in other blueprints and be used as an object like the objects this blueprint uses. The interface allows you to define what properties, events, and links are exposed and hook them up to the internal objects. So basically, you can pass in properties, events, and links into this blueprint uh, when you reference it in another blueprint. We already have a couple of input events defined here. And if we look at the event connections again, you can see there are some which start with entity.interface. 
So these are our interface events. So for example, when this blueprint receives a reset event, it sets this bool to false. Now you can obviously add more input events pretty easily. And the same is true for output events. But there's no obvious input and output property connections. Well, that's what this fields section is for. If we add a field, you can see we have options to define the name of the property and what type it is, whether it's a source, a target, or a source and a target. You can also define a default value for if it's not provided by a property connection. You can define the default value by writing its type first, for example, float32, followed by a space, and then a value, for example, 1.0. The name can be whatever you want it to be. Uh, let's just call it test and Frosty will automatically handle hashing that for you. Finally, I'll briefly talk about link connections. Uh, we don't actually have any in this asset at the moment, but like properties and events, these are pretty simple in that they're just a source and a target with a field ID. Not really 100% sure on how these work, but I think basically they're for passing references to objects uh, rather than values. These are the least common type of connection, um, so I wouldn't worry about them too much. Uh, as always, you'll be able to figure out on how to use these by copying examples uh, should you find yourself needing to. So that was a lot to take in, and it can be hard to make sense of how all of these concepts piece together right away. In reality, blueprints were never designed to be worked with in this way. The original game devs who made this blueprint using the real Frostbite editor would have used a graphical node-based editor. You might be familiar with the idea of a node editor if you've, if you've used something like Blender before. Uh, here are some screenshots we have of the Blueprint editor in the Frostbite tools uh, from various behind the scenes videos and tweets and blog posts from over the years. What I'm about to show you next is a private build of Frosty from a long time ago that I have access to, which has a node-based editor called the Blueprint Editor. This was developed by the original Frosty developer, Galaxy Man 2015, who no longer works on Frosty as they were hired by DICE in 2020, I think. The Blueprint Editor was unfinished and is pretty buggy, which is why it wasn't released. And the code is not in a state where it is easy for the current Frosty devs to pick it up, from what I understand. I can't give out this version of the Frosty Editor, I'm sorry, but I am allowed to show you the Blueprint Editor. We may yet see the Blueprint Editor added to the public version of Frosty either officially or in the form of a plugin at some point. Obviously, Frosty has just gone open source, so someone from the community might implement this themselves. With that disclaimer out of the way, here's that same slow-mo blueprint visualized in the Blueprint Editor. These are the objects, and these things on the left are the interface input events. You also have these wires between all of the objects which represent the connections. Green wires are property connections and white wires are event connections. If we had any link connections, they would be blue. And you can already tell this is a lot easier to read. So you have this input event, which is an unresolved hash, but you can guess that it starts the slow-mo effect since the only other input event is a reset one. Uh, it sets this bool to true, the value of which is compared and if it's true, this float is decremented. The value of that float is then passed into the timescale of the slow-mo object, and the current timescale is then passed into this audio mixer. The bool, float, and audio mixer are all reset by this reset event. Pretty simple, right? Hopefully that visualization makes the concepts make sense if they didn't before. Everything you can do in this version of Frosty, you can do in the public version of Frosty with the property grid. All this blueprint editor does is make it much easier to follow and manage the logic, especially in larger files. I have to say that a mod like Magrope Plus would have been a lot harder to make without this tool purely because it requires a lot of logic. It just would have required a lot more time and patience than I actually have. That's really the main problem with using the property grid. Time and patience are the main limiting factors on the scope of Blueprint modding. We're going to go back to the public version of Frosty for the rest of the tutorial though and work through a simple mod to show that it is possible. Before we start, let's take a quick look at how the slow-mo effect originally looks like in-game. So I'm just going to do this short dash uh, and you'll see when we cross the finish line the slow-mo effect kicks in instantly. The simple mod we're going to make is to make the slow-mo effects transition smoothly rather than instantly turning on. Now it looks like this slow motion entity actually has this functionality built in with these transition time values, but I'm going to take a more manual approach for the sake of demonstration. Basically what we want is to change this float value gradually over time rather than instantly decrementing it. This is actually possible using a float interpolator. 
So I can add a new object by clicking the plus button on the objects. Then I can click the three dots on the newly added empty object and click create new and then search for float interpolator and select it. Again, I know what this does already from experience and you'll start to get familiar with useful objects as you make more mods. Essentially, it models a float value and gradually changes it at a certain rate uh, until it becomes the same as this in property value. As you can see, there are a variety of properties which allow you to change the rate uh, at which the value can change. Let's say I didn't know how to use this object already and I wanted to know what properties and events are needed to hook it up. If you've watched my previous editor tips video, you might already have an idea. I'm going to use file locator to search my XML dump for examples of the float interpolator. So I'm going to have a look in this faith shield XML file. Then I'm just going to control F for float interpolator and see what we find. So as you can see, we have a property connection which passes a value into an in property. And then we have a property connection which takes a value from the out property. We also have a reset input event and that's about it in terms of connections. If we look at the object itself, you can see that it has this velocity value set to one and use velocity is true. Basically, this means that the value changes at a certain rate rather than over a fixed amount of time, which is what the uh, duration property would do if use velocity was false. So going back to the editor, we want our default value to be the default time scale value, so one, so no slow-mo. The in property is gonna be set by our property connection, so I'll leave that, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna use velocity instead of duration, so I'm gonna tick that. I'm gonna use a velocity value of something like four. Basically, that means the value can change at a maximum rate of four per second. For example, if I was to reduce a value from one to zero at a rate of four, it would take a quarter of a second, one fourth. So now let's hook this up. Basically, what we want to do is, instead of having this float entities value going directly into the slow-mo entities time scale, we want to connect it to the in property of this float interpolator and connect the float interpolator's out property to the slow-mo entity instead. So let's do that. I'm going to edit this existing property connection between the float and the slow-mo entity to target the interpolator instead by clicking the three dots and selecting our new interpolator. Then I just need to change the target field ID to in. Next, I need to connect the interpolator to the slow-mo entity. So I'm going to add a new property connection. The source is the float interpolator. The target is the slow-mo entity. The source field is out from the float interpolator. And the target field is time scale, as it was originally coming from the float into the slow-mo entity. Bear in mind that these field names are case sensitive. So that should be it, right? We're done. Well, let's launch the game and see. All right, so I'm doing the same dash again. You'll see when I cross the finish line this time, there's actually no slow-mo at all. So something's obviously not working. So why did that not work? Well, right now this mod won't work because of flags. Flags are essentially what are known as bit fields, where each bit in a binary value represents something. Frosty displays these values as numbers, which are essentially the decimal representation of a binary value. But it's the individual bits that matter and not the decimal value, if that makes sense. Fortunately, it doesn't matter too much if you don't really understand any of that, as I have some handy info to help you figure flags out. So first of all, we have property connection flags. Basically, these describe the nature of a property connection, primarily the realms of the objects involved. We haven't talked about realms yet, but you may have noticed them throughout the tutorial. For example, objects often have a realm property, which may say something like a realm client or realm server. We also saw that event connections have a target type, which have similar realm options. It's kind of a weird concept, especially since Mirror's Edge Catalyst is a single player game. So the idea of a server doesn't make much sense. And to tell the truth, I don't really know what the realms mean, uh, but they are important. So Cade, the main Frosty developer at the moment, posted this message in the Frosty Discord server, which acts as a bit of an, a cheat sheet for property connection flags. Essentially, if you look at the realms involved in the connection, you can use this guide to figure out the likely flags required. Note that these values are written in hexadecimal notation, which you can actually write into Frosty and it will automatically convert it to a decimal number. Bear in mind, as Cade says, there are some oddballs which don't follow these rules, so these flags aren't guaranteed to work. Generally speaking, I find a flag value of two works more often than not. So I tend to try that first before doing anything else. 
If none of the suggested flags in that post work, the best thing to do as usual is to look for examples in an XML dump. I'm just gonna be lazy here and use a flag value of two in this new property connection for now and hope that it works. Spoiler alert, it will. The other kind of flags is object flags, which you can see on each of these objects and they tend to be much larger numbers. Like property connection flags, these are bit fields, but they work differently. There are some posts from Brawltendo on the Frosty Discord server which explain these. Essentially, the first or least significant 24 bits are based on the GUID of the object. Frosty actually generates these automatically, which is why we have a value here already. But the remaining eight most significant bits are the actual flags that have purpose. And Brawltendo has identified the purpose of six of these flags, but there are two which are currently unknown. If any of these flag descriptions are relevant for the current object, they must be set. For example, this new interpolator we added is the target of a client property connection. So the is client property connection target flag should be set. Fortunately, I have made a tool for this, which makes it a lot easier. I'll provide a link to this in the description as usual. With this tool, you can paste in any flags value and it will show you which flags are enabled for it. For example, if we copy the slow-mo entities flags, we can see that it has this unknown flag set and is also a client and server event connection target. If we copy the flags from our new float interpolator object, you can see it has none of these flags set. There are bits set, but they're all within the least significant 24 bits, which is from the object's GUID as explained before. So what flags does this component need? Well, we have a client property connection that targets this object. So we need the client property connection target flag. As you can see, when we check that flag, it toggles the corresponding bit in the bit field. I think that's the only flag that applies here. So we can just copy this new value back into Frosty. We should also quickly check the other objects that are affected by this change we made, which are the float and the slow-mo entity. We checked the float entity earlier and it already had the event connection flag set and we haven't added any new uh, connections into it that would require changing here. So we can actually leave that one as it is. Uh, let's have a look at the slow-mo entity. So this has client property connection inputs uh, and nothing else. And we haven't added anything else. Actually, that is fine already. So now our mod should work, fingers crossed. Let's launch the game and try it out. Okay, so it's definitely going into slow-mo again. Uh, the transition effect is a little bit subtle, so I'll put a side-by-side, -side, just so you can see the difference. But there we have it, our first basic mod. And I'll upload my project file for this in case you want to download it and check it out. Uh, the link will be in the description. So let's quickly recreate those changes in the Blueprint Editor to visualize what we've done here. So first of all, we added a new float interpolator. Then we moved our property connection from between the float and slow-mo entity to the float interpolators in property and the output of the float interpolator to the slow-mo entity. And then we set some flags and values, but I won't bother doing that. What matters is that you can visualize the new flow of this logic. Now, I know this was kind of a long video for what now looks like an extremely simple change, but there were a lot of concepts that I had to explain along the way. Before I wrap up the video, I just want to give a few tips and advice for Blueprint modding. Perhaps most importantly is that you should add to your mod in small amounts at a time, test frequently, and try to always have a way to prove that your changes are really working. Doing too much at once makes it really hard to debug when it doesn't work, as there are so many places you could have made a mistake, especially with flags. Usually if something looks like it should work, but it doesn't, it's because of flags. There's no real debugging tools, so it can be especially difficult to figure out where your mod is going wrong. You can add some text to the UI to display useful values to help debug, which I will have a separate video on, but that requires a little bit of work to set up. Sometimes though, things just don't work and you can't explain why. This happens to me a lot and I don't pretend to be an expert on any of this stuff. There's still probably a lot that I don't know. And that's just how it works out sometimes. So don't try to do too much at once because it could turn out that it doesn't work and you just wasted your time. I know that's very demoralizing, but if you're patient and persevere, you can do some really cool stuff with blueprints, which makes it all worth it. As I've said many times already, using an XML dump to learn from examples is the best way to figure out how things work. And sometimes you just need to use your intuition and try things to see what happens. Anyway, that's all for this video. I'll have some more videos in the future that will involve more logic modding. So be sure to check those out for more examples. Until then, good luck and have fun.